Well, if successful, the coup would represent the eighth in West and Central Africa in the past three years. Now, many of those countries are former French colonies, including Niger and Gabon. We've been getting uh, some reaction from the French government today. Here's the government spokesperson, Olivier Véran. La France condamne. France condemns the military coup that is underway in Gabon and France is closely monitoring developments on the ground and reaffirms its wish that the result of the election, when known, can be respected. We are watching this very closely. Well, let's get some analysis then on the situation in Gabon. Paul Melly joins me on the line now. He's a consulting fellow at the Africa programme at Chatham House based in London. Thanks very much indeed, sir, for your time on the programme. Um, this is a really fast moving story in Gabon today. Your thoughts on what we've seen in the last few hours and particularly that rather extraordinary video statement from the president, Ali Bongo. Well, I think what we get from the video statement is a sense of uh, Ali Bongo's shock, if you like, that after this incredibly long period, 55 years, as you said, of uh, family rule, first by his father, Omar Bongo, and then himself from 2009 onwards, suddenly um, his regime, this family regime, which had seemed a fixture, if you like, of the Central African region, has been uh, deposed by its own soldiers. Um, that the overwhelming thing that comes across is that he is clearly, as it were, without moorings, without anchor points. Um, he's cut off and isolated, and there isn't, if you like, a political agenda. In that sense, is rather different from the situation in Niger, where um, President Bazoum uh, had been elected in 2021 in an election that was seen as fairly credible uh, by international observers and by the West African region, and where um, he had, that was when he came to power. Uh, it wasn't, you don't have a long history of family regime. So it's a very different situation. Well, what is true in Gabon is that um, over the time that the Bongo family have been in power, they have um, delivered some prosperity. But there have been real shortcomings, given that this is a country with a small population and substantial oil resources. And so the development track record has actually been rather disappointing in many respects. Uh, Bongo got a lot of international respect for his environmental policies, his protection of the rainforest. But in terms of jobs, social programs, public services uh, for the ordinary Gabonese, there, there there was a lot of dissatisfaction and among many younger Gabonese, a sense of uh, when will we have the chance to have our own say? How can we choose who should lead us? Why do we have to assume that it's a fixed point that always the Wongo family will be in charge? Indeed. And, and on that, we haven't had a statement yet, as far as I'm aware, from the military generals who purport to be in power now in Gabon. But does it seem likely to you that they will want to try to hold on to power, as we've seen in other post-coup countries like Niger that you mentioned? Or could this be the beginning of a democratic transfer in Gabon? Well, they obviously want to send the signal that that's what they're about. If you look even at the name of what they've called themselves and the agenda that they set out in that first statement on television, it's about protecting the institution, the constitution, if you like. So although they've dissolved the institutions of the republic, they appear to be, without using the word democracy, saying that that's the motivation for the coup. And the background to this is that when Ali Bongo's father, Omar, died in 2009 and there was an election, Ali Bongo himself was elected in a, in a contest that had other candidates, but whose result, if you like, seemed cloudy. Um, and then equally his re-election in 2016 was surrounded by um, opacity, decided only by some very late final results from an area where his family are politically dominant and where the records of it from the polling stations were destroyed immediately afterwards. So with those very... Uh, shaky, if you like, or uncertain, opaque 
election results as his previous, as the basis for his previous terms in office, uh, this third mandate, um, the fact that people, there were doubts about the credibility of the election, that's something that, of point of view, if you like, that very many people will share. And that has many people wondered, why is he standing yet again? Because he suffered a stroke in 2018. Although he's made a fairly good recovery, many people felt, well, that was, you know, he's done two terms, he's had a period of ill health, now should be time to move on. And yet they felt the political system wasn't allowing them to do that. Just one brief final question, if I can, uh, Mr. Melly. In some of these other post-coup countries in Central and West Africa, uh, anti-French sentiment is running very high indeed. Is that the case in Gabon? Uh, it's possibly a bit less. And um, the French presence, although France has a very long-standing close relationship with Gabon, France has kept a certain distance. Um, when Emmanuel Macron visited Gabon, he was very, very uh, insistent in stating he'd only gone there for an international environment conference. He was not getting involved in the political process, and his visit was not meant as any kind of endorsement of the Gabon government and its agenda. So um, France has stood back a bit, if you like, in Gabon. And uh, that's that's a bit of a contrast, of course, with the situation in in the Sahelian countries, which have seen coups, where there are a lot of French troops or have been over recent years. In, indeed. Paul Melly, thank you very much indeed, talking to us there from Chatham House in London. Thank you.